In this episode of Restore It, it's more progress on the 325i Touring. I'm going to make a start on the rusty holes in the floor panels, fix the leaky throttle body, make the temporary immobiliser delete permanent, rebuild the dashboard, and test the clutch and gearbox properly. This episode is going to contain slightly less work on the car than usual, as I've been busy behind the scenes and have a few exciting announcements to make. As some of you will know, the road has been a bit rough for Restore It in recent years. With multiple workshop moves, even a country move and back, as well as the terrible decision to restore a rotten Mercedes W123 for a customer, which took the best part of two years to complete, whilst I was making other restoration videos for the channel at the same time, in a hobby grade workshop that was way too big and expensive to run. All of which was my own fault, but it really hindered my ability to make consistent content like I did before I moved to Spain. But, on the bright side, very recently I've invested all of my money into a smaller, more professional grade workshop in the UK that's going to enable me to restore more things than ever, faster than ever. The only issue with a smaller workshop is that I can't hoard as many things or E30s as I would like to, which is why the Touring is having its mini restoration now and is then going to be sold. Firstly, so I can have the space for the 325i Sport main project, but also to help fund it, as I'm sure most of you know, car restoration isn't cheap. So as sad as it is, for me, the Touring has to be sold. At least, that was the plan until I discovered a company called Raffle, and decided one of you lovely viewers should win it instead. Raffle is a company that allows someone like me or you to host prize competitions that cannot be fixed or faked. Raffle generate a winner at the end of the competition and that's it. One of you will be winning my E30 325i Touring. The raffle hasn't started yet, but to know when it does, follow me on Raffle using the link in the video description. So that's the first bit of exciting news I have for you. The second is that after six years on YouTube, I'm finally doing merch. Starting today, for a limited time only, you can order the Restore It staff t-shirt from Bonfire at the link in the description, which is now also available as a hoodie, a sweatshirt, long sleeve t-shirt and more. These will only be available for 21 days before it will end and then all of the orders will be processed at once. These t-shirts are really good quality and very premium feeling. I've been wearing the crap out of the 12 samples that I got from Bonfire about two years ago. I know, two years, I'm a busy guy, but at least you can't say I didn't test them out properly before putting them on sale. All jokes aside, these t-shirts have really lasted the test of time, the workshop and the washing machine and I don't think you'll be disappointed. And, as well as the classic black, they're now also available in a variety of colours which I'm really looking forward to as having 12 of the same colour can get a bit boring. So to get your Restore It t-shirt or hoodie, go to Bonfire at the link in the description or click on the photo in the merch shelf under the video. So that's the housekeeping done, let's crack on with the touring. The first thing I'm going to do is remove a few more pieces of vibration damping and see if there are any more spots of rust hiding underneath before I cut the spots I can see. Before I can remove the piece that sits over the gearbox tunnel, I need to remove the lumen connectors as I don't want to mount them along with the adhesive. Like I did in the last episode, I'm using a heat gun and a panel splitter to easily remove these pieces. I still have no idea what this red stuff is, but I will remove it before putting the new dampening in. With that piece done, I can now do the rear footwells. I'm not expecting to find any rust under these, but it's worth a look whilst I'm here. Well, the driver's side looks good. And so does this side, so that's good news. Now I can remove the old glue and any leftover bits of damping so I can get a good look at the surface. Now, I'm all for good products that do a specific job, like removing glue and adhesive, but sometimes they come at a premium and in annoyingly small quantities which can quickly run out. And that's where I'm at now, I've run out of all of the different types of sprays that I had to remove this kind of stuff. So as a test I'm trying some white spirit, and what do you know, good old white spirit, it's as good as anything else I've tried, if not even better. And it's just £5 for 2 litres. This is definitely what I'm going to be using from now on, it's an absolute bargain. So with all of that clean, the tunnel and rear footwells are now looking good. The left side of the tunnel is fine, but there is a little spot on the right hand side that was hiding under the damping, so I'll add that to the spots that I'm going to do in this episode. But firstly, I want to look at the three that I've already marked and strip them back to see how far they go. Starting from the top side, I'm removing the red paint and cleaning the area around the holes so I can see what's going on. Well, as the rust is coming from the other side, I can't see much at all. It'll be under the underseal that the true extent of the rust will be revealed. I do wonder how these holes start, as their location seems to be completely random. The two spots that I can't see from the underside are partially sitting on top of this structural support beam, which is the reason why the rust is there. And these ones make more sense, as there's two pieces of metal welded together there. Anyway, let's get this underseal out of the way and see how far they go. 
I find using a wood chisel is a really good way of quickly seeing where the rust stops, and it also makes less work and mess for the wire wheel which is coming next. Thankfully, this one is just a circle evenly spread out around the hole. I've drilled a small hole so I can quickly see where the support beam is as to not cut into it. The same goes for this hole, just on a smaller scale. The rust hasn't spread that far. With the underseal out of the way, I can now cut around the rust, making sure I cut far enough so that I'm welding onto clean, solid metal. Before I do that, I have a quick question. Who would buy an E30 M3 from BMW if they were to start producing them again today? I'm pretty sure a large number of us would say, yes, I'll have one please. The only problem is, that is never going to happen. Which is why the value of them is only going one way, and that's up. It's been like this for a long time now and will continue in the same direction, forever. Making it almost impossible for some of us to ever get the chance to own one. Well, don't worry, as the genius at E30 Garage Norway is doing us all a favour. Not only is he very close to offering 98% of an E30 chassis in replacement metal parts, but he already offers a complete BMW E30 M3 chassis and full metal M3 kits to convert any E30 coupe, convertible, four-door or touring into an M3 coupe, M3 convertible, M3 four-door or M3 touring. No fiberglass, all metal. And not only that, he will convert your rusty old E30 for you in-house, during which your chassis will be dipped in acid, all, and I mean all of the rust, will be removed and replaced with new E30 Garage Norway panels, the conversion kit will be added, and it will be given a fresh e-coat. You choose the colours you'd like, inside and out, as well as the underseals you'd like, which he will handle, and then you are left with what is a brand new BMW E30 M3 chassis that can be shipped globally straight to your door. You can even have the entire shell powder coated if that's what you want and he's working towards offering a roll cage option as well. And if you don't have an E30 to begin with, he will source one for you, ship it to the main factory where the M3 kits are made, do the restoration work in-house, add the required M3 panels in-house and finish it to your specifications ready for you to rebuild. He also has the M3 door skins to convert the standard E30 doors which you can see here. I took these in for one of his customers in the UK. He also offers the rear bench seat foam and high quality fabric to match as they're also different on the M3s and extremely hard to get hold of. Besides the S14 engine, he has everything you need to make a fully metal M3 chassis and start from zero again. No rust, properly protected and in any colour of your choice. It almost sounds too good to be true, go and check his website right now and see for yourself. The guy at E30 Garage Norway is working with top tool designers in Sweden to make these E30 replacement panels, some of which BMW have never sold. And would you believe it, this is just a hobby for him that got out of control. He already has another company doing something else. So this isn't a living, it's more of a passion project fueled by his love for E30s and cool technology. And like I said before, he's very close to offering 98% of an E30 in metal parts which you can see on his website right now and he will be moving on to E36 and E46 in the near future, which is absolutely mind blowing when you consider it's just him doing this. He's pretty much on his own apart from the M3 conversions where there are four professionals helping him. So what this guy is doing is truly unbelievable and I honestly don't know what I would have done without all of the panels I've got from him in the past. It would have been many, many hours in the scrapyard cutting old rusty bits out. So if you're in need of any replacement panels for your E30 or E30 M3, go and check out E30 Garage Norway. If you'd like to turn your coupe, convertible, four-door or touring into a full metal version, or even have him find you one for conversion, go and check out E30 Garage Norway at the link below. You'll be seeing some of his panels soon during this series, as well as in the 325i Sport shortly after, so stay tuned for that. Big thanks to E30 Garage Norway for supporting the channel as always. Check him out in the link in the description, and go and show him some love on Instagram, as he's always sharing cool behind the scenes stuff that is, quite frankly, E30 porn. Let's get back to the touring. So these first two are pretty straightforward flat rectangles. With four cuts on each, the rust is gone. This one is going to be a bit more complicated as I need to split it from the panel beneath and it's located right in the middle of two bends which will have to be put into the new piece. The underseal is still partially attached to this piece and it's making it more difficult to split than it should be, so from now on I'll make sure it's gone before I start cutting.
With the rotten top layer gone, you can see that the panel underneath is very rusty, and this will be the case for most of the car, and for most E30s out there today. And that's why I think everyone who owns an E30 should quickly strip it down completely, dip it in acid, e-coat it, and then epoxy prime it when they get a moment to do so. And that's also why I'm calling this a mini restoration and not a proper restoration like the 325i Sport, which will be getting dipped in acid to remove the rust you can't see without unspot welding the entire chassis. So even though I'm removing the metal that has rusted so badly it's gone, which is good, it's still just scratching the surface of this touring. This is more preventative maintenance rather than a restoration. So what I'm doing is removing all of the rust I can see on the panel below, protecting the bare metal, and replacing the completely rotten metal on top, which will also be protected on the side facing down. Before I make a start on the spot I found underneath the vibration damping, I want to get these pieces made and take the exhaust off to make it easier to get to. Using the pieces I've cut out that weren't destroyed in the process as a template, I'm cutting the new pieces out of some 1.2mm steel which matches the chassis. As you can see, the hole in this piece is quite close to the cut line. This is because the metal on the other side of the cut is sitting on top of a structural beam, which is also quite rusty and will need another piece putting on top of it after this piece is done. This final piece is going to need a little bit of imagination and a lot of trial and error to create. I've got to make it big enough to accommodate the bends, but small enough to fit into the gap. It's quite a long process to get it just right, so I'll skip 90% of the work as it does get a bit repetitive. With those three pieces made, the car can go back on the ramp and we can take a look at the back side of the cuts. You can also see the exhaust is right in the way of the more complicated hole. This one is going to be straightforward with clean metal all around. But this one, which has started because of the line of spot welds running along the beam beneath it, has also spread into the other direction over the beam and will probably need more cutting out and grinding down. So to get to the two above the exhaust, it's got to come off. Thankfully, it's only temporarily attached and won't take a minute to remove. As I'm doing this on my own, I'm using the engine crane to support it at the rear as this thing is rather heavy. With the nuts loose, I can bring it down and put it with the rest of the parts. This exhaust hasn't been used since I sprayed it with high temp matte black and it's already in this condition, which is why I'll be seracoating the entire exhaust before it goes back in the car which will provide real protection against the elements. Now that it's out of the way, I can easily get to all of the holes and remove the underseal around the edges. It's hard to see with all of the underseal there, but there are thousands of spot welds holding panels together from the front of the chassis to the back, all of which are prone to rust after this much time, even with an e-coat, sealant and paint for protection. Using the more aggressive style of wire wheel, I'm removing the underseal around the edges of the cuts to make sure the metal is good and also to prevent the underseal from catching fire. As you can see, I've mistakenly cut through the panel below on the middle repair, which will have to be welded up from this side when the new piece goes in. So with all of the surrounding underseal removed, these two are good, but this one is falling apart along the edge closest to the supporting beam, so I'm definitely going to have to cut more out. Before I do that, I'm going to remove the paint and e-coating from around the repairs to get them ready for welding. Now that I'm onto this one, I'm going to remove the rest of the bad metal from the right side of the hole and make a piece that will fit into its place. Here you can see the rusty structural beam underneath that hasn't been exposed to daylight for 33 years, but is rusting just fine under all of that underseal and paint. So after much grinding, splitting and wire wheeling, this is what I'm left with. I've got the original hole and patch that I made, and now a mostly uniform shape to the right, which is slightly raised, which will get welded in once the first piece is done. So with these prepped and ready to go, I want to turn my attention to this little spot of rust that is bulging out of the floor. It might look quite harmless, but it feels like tree roots growing underneath the pavement, trying to break their way through. So I'm pretty sure there is some serious rust going on underneath the top layer. It's a pretty deceptive patch of rust, as now that I've ground it down, it doesn't look too bad at all. Let's get this cut out and see how bad it really is. This piece is also partly attached to the panel underneath it and will need splitting off. This feels like bloody time team. I'm like Tony Robinson discovering past civilizations. So as you can see, it's an utter rust fest under here. 
I really do stand by what I say. If you own an E30, go and dip it in acid right now. With the rotten piece removed, I can now see the bad surface rust on the piece beneath. Thankfully, it is only surface rust. I can now remove the small piece of understeel that's under the single layer of metal, remove as much rust as possible and prep the surrounding area for welding. That's looking much better. Now to remove the underseal for this piece and I'll be ready to weld. As you can see, the rust only exists as surface rust where the two pieces lap over each other. And it only becomes a real problem when it starts to rot the metal on top or below it. But when it does, it needs to be removed or it will spread and will only get worse. So after all of that prep, it's finally time to weld in some new metal. I've got the four main pieces ready to go, each with a 1-2mm to gap between the chassis that will be filled in with the welder. Before I put the first tack down, I'm using this piece of scrap to fine tune the welder to achieve the flattest welds possible without blowing through. I'm still getting used to this Artec welder, and as good as it is, it's still down to me to set it up and use it correctly so it works as well as it's able to. To weld these pieces in, I'm making sure the two surfaces are completely flush before I add the tacks. The piece I've made is very close, but it's not perfect. So this means I need to slightly force it into place, which I do by using a screwdriver to push one side down and the other up until the two meet perfectly. It's only a few millimetre that I'm moving it by, but I feel like it makes all the difference when it comes to the finished product. I'm finding the biggest issue working in the footwells is that it's awkward to get to and hard to see what's going on, which makes it difficult to keep things neat as you have to be very precise about where you place the gun before you pull the trigger. As for the height of the welds, in hindsight I think I could have gone a little bit higher on the amps without blowing through, so I'll give that a go in the next episode and show you how I get on. So that's the first one in. It's not pretty, as Fitzy would say, but it's nothing a grinder can't fix. Before I weld in this next piece, I first need to protect the metal beneath. Zinc rich weld through primer is ideal for this sort of thing, as like it says on the tin, it won't interfere with the welds and it has good rush preventing properties. And the same goes for the back of the new piece. With that done, I can now tack it in place and fill in the gaps. So that's two down, two to go. I've melted one of these drain plugs by mistake, which some guy in America is selling for seven bucks each, but I wonder if BMW still stock them and how much they charge. I'm scared to even think about it to be honest. Moving on to the larger piece at the bottom of the gearbox tunnel, I'm adding the protection to both sides first, and now I can put it in place and weld it in. I won't be able to get to the back of all of these welds, but I will be going over the bits I can from underneath as well especially where the welds haven't penetrated 100%. And with the final weld done, this piece is ready to grind. And oh boy, does it need grinding. So finally, we can move on to the last piece for this episode, this special two-parter. Part 1 is pretty straightforward, it's just requiring a lot of screwdriver action to keep it flush, as my piece is perfectly flat and this particular section of floor isn't. Some of these welds are the flattest I've done today because I've been slowly turning it up, but I still feel like they could be flatter and more consistent, so next episode I'll try a slightly smaller gap to hopefully stop the odd blow through and higher amps to see how flat I can get them. With the first part in, I can now clean up the second section, make the new piece and protect both sides. I'm welding this piece in along one side so it's got enough strength to allow me to bend the other side to where it needs to be. Now I can use a hammer to make the bend and have it line up with the other patch.
And there we are, all four pieces welded in, from this side at least. If we now take a look at the back of these welds, we can see good penetration on most of them and there are only a couple of tiny pinholes to fill. But to make sure they're definitely strong, I'm going to go over most of the backside and do the bits I couldn't get to from the other side. Well, these don't currently look any prettier for it, but I can now dress this side first and then do the other side knowing that this side is solid. To completely remove the high points of these welds, I'm using a 40 grit flap disc in a grinder to get the job done as quickly as possible. With that done, I can now come back over with the finger sander, being careful not to touch either side of the welds and weaken the metal that I want to keep. I'm whizzing past this as, let me tell ya, there was a lot of grinding to do. But now that's done, it's looking very flat and ready for some zinc primer to protect it for now. There are a few more spots to grind down right next to the beam, but I might actually come back to this and add more material to this spot before I do, just so I don't have to grind down as much of the good metal around it in that hard to reach spot. With the underside done, I can now do the very satisfying job of grinding down the top of the welds to finish the job. I'm doing the same again, starting with the flat disc, but this time I'm finishing with a palm sander as I'm finding that it's working quicker than the belt sander. Slowly but surely, they're becoming invisible. And there we go, that's all four repairs finished. Now I can protect this side with zinc primer and tick those four spots off the list. With the primer on, I can't see exactly where they used to be, which is a very good sign and is exactly what I was trying to achieve. This footwell is now looking a bit better. I have left the hardest repairs for last, but I look forward to having this right side complete, as that will be one big thing ticked off the list. Changing the subject completely, if you remember back to the previous episode, I had a rather large coolant leak coming from the throttle body when I tested the engine. To find out what's going on, I'm going to remove the idle control valve and the MAF so I can remove the throttle body and the cover where the leak was coming from. I don't fully understand why the coolant has to come through here, but I do know it can be deleted. Does anyone actually know what's going on here and why the coolant has to flow through this piece which is attached to the throttle body? It just seems like an odd choice, but I might be missing something. So this cover is a little bit corroded, but it turns out I've been missing the gasket altogether this whole time. It must have been another thing that I forgot to add when I was in Spain. So all I need to do is clean up both sides, add the gasket and refit the cover. This should fix the leak, which I'm pretty sure is the only one in the entire system, which isn't bad going. With the new gasket in, I can now install the cover and reattach the throttle body to the inlet manifold. This is looking better. I have no idea how I missed this before. At least I didn't miss the coolant spurting out. With the throttle body in, I can now do the idle control valve, and finally, the MAF. So that's all of the obvious issues fixed. I'll give the engine a test a bit later on in this episode, but now I can focus on getting it running as smooth as possible. Before I do that test, I want to make the temporary fix on the immobiliser delete permanent, and wrap all of the wires in Tessa tape before I start putting the glove box and dash back together. There were only two wires that I had to cut to remove the immobiliser, so all I'm doing here is removing the temporary pieces we put in, replacing them with the correct length and gauge wire, and two pieces of heat shrink. I used to be useless at joining two pieces of wire like this, but recently I've cracked it, making for a nice strong low profile join that doesn't require a massive piece of heat shrink to cover. With those two done, I can now wrap this section of loom with tether tape to complete the job.
And there we go, it's looking much nicer than before and that horrible immobiliser is now gone for good. Up next I'm installing the glove box latch so the darn thing will stay up on its own and out of the way. I'm wrapping up this mess of speaker and radio wires which I'm going to leave until the end during the finishing touches stage. With the catch in I can now install the two plastics that sit above and to the side of the glove box. These two pieces are held in with big plastic screw thumbs, some of which are missing, so I'll have to add some to my next order from BMW. Once they arrive, the right side of the top piece will sit flush with the bottom of the dashboard nicely. Before I close the glove box, I've noticed something has been spilt in here and the sooner I clean it off, the better. I'm using some Zep interior shampoo and a brass brush to lift whatever is in this fabric out of it. I'm not sure if this has worked really well or if the whole thing is just the same colour because it's damp. It definitely looks cleaner, but we'll find out when it dries out. For now I'm going to add the supporting struts on each side and see if it will lock into the catch. Well, that feels nice. I'm still missing the little button for the light and the light itself, but I'll come across those before the end of the project I'm sure. I have just noticed this small dent in the front of the glove box. Does anyone know if a steam cleaner will get this out with the heat? And if not, if anyone's got any suggestions about this, I'd really appreciate it. With that done, I'm going to put the dash back together with all of the parts I was able to find in the storeroom. I can't remember which button goes where, but this car definitely doesn't have aircon, I'm just putting that there to fill the gap. Once everything is plugged back in towards the end of the project, I'll come back to these and make sure they're all correct. I've noticed that the fascia is cracked in two places and will need to be replaced with a crack-free one, which I should have in the storeroom somewhere. For now though, that's most of the dash located and put back together. Now I know that all of the earths under the steering column are good, I can reinstall the trim piece that sits underneath. Four screws, two of which I had to steal from the four door, secure it in place and the steering wheel is now the only thing missing. As for the driver's side kick panel, I have it, I just don't have the flathead rectangular screws needed to fit it, so they're going on the list as well. I'm not looking forward to seeing how much all of this is going to come to, considering the £9 charge for the tiny sunroof clip in the last episode, which by the way has arrived and now I have both ready for the rebuild. So this is as much progress as I can make on the dashboard for now until those screws arrive. With those four welds dealt with, I can reinstall the first half of the exhaust so the engine isn't super loud whilst I check for leaks. With the exhaust back in, I'm temporarily installing the driver's seat so I can test the clutch and gearbox to make sure everything is working as it should. With that done, I can turn the key and see how it goes. It's definitely idling better than it was the first time round. The leak is gone, it's not losing any coolant, it doesn't seem to be misfiring, and it's not smoking out the back. And thankfully, it sounds like a proper engine when I give it some revs. I think with the bonnet closed, the second half of the exhaust on and a fuel tank of petrol, it will be just fine. However, I am going to try and service most of the things attached to this engine to see just how well I can get it to run, as right now it's feeling a little bit more clunky than it should. I've just remembered this engine does have upgraded injectors that I got from my friend Sergio at BavarianVerka.com. So this engine was running very smoothly just after we installed them in Spain. So something's clearly not right at the moment, but I'm sure we'll get to the bottom of it soon. The clutch and gearbox are working as they should, and it's finally starting to feel like a real car once again. There is a slightly concerning noise coming from the engine bay at super low RPMs, so I'll have to see if I can find out what's causing that in the next episode. So don't forget, one of you will be winning this car. Make sure you go and follow me on raffle at raffle.com forward slash restore it or just click the link in the video description and hit the follow button to know as soon as the raffle goes live. I don't think a huge amount of people are going to enter compared to other car raffles out there, so have a go and you never know, my E30 Touring might just become your E30 Touring. And don't forget, if you want to get your hands on the Restore It tee, go to the bonfire link in the video description and make sure you order before the limited time runs out. Whilst I've got the seat in front of me, it's reminded me that I may have found the guy when it comes to retrimming E30 seats. He's called at E underscore 30 underscore interiors on Instagram, and this guy can do it all. 
seats, door cards, headliners, dashboards, everything to a very high level, so hopefully we'll be seeing his work on the channel soon. With the first four patches done, by the end of next episode I hope to have the rest of this footwell finished, including the panels from E30 Garage Norway. I'm going to do that service I was talking about, and if everything arrives in time, I'll finish putting the dash back together, or at least make sure everything's there and swap out the broken fascia. I'm also going to go around the entire top part of the chassis and remove any visible spots of rust like this one. So that's all I had time for in this episode. Thanks so much for watching. I hope to see you then.